We are going to do some more work on generating nutrition facts tables with Esha. And we just did an initial recipe together. And so do take some time. If this is your first uh, recipe um, generating a nutrition facts table, go back to the first video and make sure that you can sign into Splash Top as part of that. But let's do a little bit more complexity this time and add some more layers onto our work. So. At the end of this video, you'll be able to enter a basic recipe into the Asha software and we'll add an ingredient to the database for a product in your formula. And so let's get on with it. Um, just a reminder, we are working with the regulations from the Food and Drug Regulations and Safe Food for Canadians Act, and they are interpreted in the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry as published by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So. Um, I've shared the link with this before, and I highly encourage you to go in and take a look at the nutrition facts table uh, regulations. If you're hearing the pinging going on, I've already preloaded Splash Top, so we're not sitting around singing the Jeopardy song waiting for Splash Top to load, and it's just pinging those silly um, bubbles in Splash Top. But we'll jump to Splash Top in just a moment. Just a reminder most foods need nutrition facts tables, some foods are exempt, fresh fruits and vegetables. Are exempt. Today we're going to be making some um, carrot salad and because it's a composed product with multiple fruits and er, multiple vegetables in it and other other things it's got to have a nutrition facts table and I wanted to show you some additional features in Esha. So uh, this, the video I made this morning was about me making breakfast well now you get to meet me as I'm making my dinner. So I had some carrot coleslaw some carrots, some kale, some hemp seeds, some uh, pumpkin seeds, and oh, uh, the, I took this photo so you could see, but I added some salad dressing to that. And that was a, a, a purchased salad dressing. And I want to show you how you can add an ingredient that has um, a, a other ingredients to it, what we call components, into the database in Esha. So, that's the end of that slideshow. Uh, don't leave me yet. We are going to jump straight into Splash Top here. And I've preloaded Esha for you so that you don't have to wait and wait around and uh, listen for that. I uh, Now, you know very well you should be weighing out your ingredients. You should be documenting it as you're going along so that you can accurately repeat what you're doing. You know that now. I'm just going to pull some numbers here. Um, but let's make a new recipe. And let's go, Esha. There we go. And we'll call it carrot coleslaw. And for now, I'm not going to define what the serving size is. And if you remember, in the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, they have reference serving sizes for food products that don't necessarily have a defined serving. If I was, let's say I'm making a salad bowl with the extended shelf life and selling it in the deli counter, maybe one bowl is one serving. And therefore that I've got some leeway in, in, in how I'm going to determine it versus if I'm selling a big bucket of it and people would buy that bucket, let's say at Costco and they would serve themselves. In that case, I'm going to be relying more on the reference serving size to define what that serving size should be. But for now, I'm just going to leave it, empty because again I can go back and edit that at a later point. I'm going to forget about these boxes for now. We will bit by bit get onto some of the more complex features. Today we're going to focus on adding an ingredient. So carrot coleslaw, we'll leave it at one serving and we'll click OK. So carrot and click OK and I'm going to click on my supplier here and see if I can find from United States Department of Agriculture, and I will leave it as a carrot, fresh, large. Because it's by weight, it doesn't really matter what size carrot it is. Pardon me. Select. And let's just say I had 100 grams. 100, tab 8 grams. And I had some kale. And I will click on supplier. Slide down to USDA, kale, that was kale fresh, chop, 
it was actually Russian kale, but I'm going. So this is uh, it was, this is something that we talked about in the previous slideshow. That let's say I've got kale from California one day, and then the next day I'm able to get kale from Ontario. The nutritional quality is going to be slightly different, and sometimes it's okay to make some approximations. I remember a student last year was doing a product in one of their product development projects, and they were using. Um, oh, what was it? Ancho chilies. And we couldn't find ancho chilies in the database. And I said, are ancho chilies, one, a major component in your recipe? And we, we did an estimate and we said, you know what? The quantity that's there is, is pretty low. Is it okay for us to make a substitution between an ancho chili versus, let's say, a jalapeno? Um, in some cases, it's okay to make those approximations. And when we're thinking about compliance on these labels, because this is not something that's fortified, it's not a meal replacement product, it's not intended for infants or um, vulnerable populations, people in the hospital, for example, this is a product that allows for a plus or minus 20% variance in the values that we're finding on this nutrition facts table. So sometimes it's okay to make an approximation. I realize you don't want to go and say kale curly fresh versus kale chips or kale smoothie. Kale fresh here versus kale fresh here versus kale fresh chopped here is likely pretty close, but I couldn't just up and substitute kale smoothie or dehydrated kale chips for kale curly fresh. So let's put it as kale curly fresh, select, and let's say that was 25 grams. Again, I, I should have weighed everything out, but I just took a photo of the salad that I made for dinner. You know very well at this point you're weighing things out, hemp seeds. So I don't want dark chocolate covered hemp seeds. I'm going to click on supplier and hemp seeds hulled as in the USDA database, select. And let's see, that was about 20 grams. And pumpkin seeds. And again, I'll pull that from, those are pumpkin seed dry kernels. I, here's a key question. I don't remember if they were dried or if they were roasted kernels. Odds are very good that these two are negligible in terms of changing the nutritional quality. You remember from before, I could check and see which one it is, and I can go back, I can save this file, I can call up my supplier, in this case it would be Bulk Barn, and find out more, and then adjust my recipe at a later point. I can save my EXL file and make those adjustments at a later point. This will be useful as we jump into a, a future project where I'm going to ask you to make some nutritional improvements on an existing recipe that you've entered. So I'm going to leave it a pumpkin seeds roasted kernel uh, unsalted select and let's put in, I don't know, 25 grams. You know how to do this at this point. It's pretty straightforward to enter in the name of a product, search through that database, start with USDA or Health Canada reference database as your first line of defense. Now that was my base coleslaw, but wait a second, I had, I'm going to see if it's there. Oh, see, I had Renee's Mighty Caesar salad dressing and I put, I put about 30 grams, a large heaping spoon. I should have weighed it. I should have weighed it. I'm going to tell myself I should have weighed it. Put 30 grams on my salad and stirred it up and served it to my family. Um, let's jump back to Splash Top here and see if that's in there. Let's type Renee's in there. And Renee's is not in there. Mighty Caesar. Nope, so that's all right. Here's, let me click on cancel here. And I'm going to go back to what we see here. If, let's say, uh, I'm using a, a consumer packaged good and it has a nutrition facts table. Maybe I've got an ingredient, a raw ingredient from an industrial ingredient supplier. They should be able to get me a nutrition facts table on my raw ingredient as well. And this is very, very common to ask for. 
I've got that nutrition facts table right there. I've also got my ingredient list here. And this is going to be important. I'm going to actually grab that ingredient list. I'm going to make myself a sticky note here. I've got some questions. I'm going to add a new note. And I'm going to get rid of that. There we go. So I've got my post-it note here with my information. So there's my ingredients. I can add that at a later point in my ESHA. I'm going to enter all this nutrition facts table and enter a new ingredient. So let's jump back out and I can go into, into file and I can go new and I can go ingredient. So new ingredient and I'm going to enter Renee's or E N E E mighty Caesar dressing. And I need to think, what is the serving size? It is going to be one tablespoon. Ideally, I should know what the weight is. And on the package, let's see. I'm finding that from... Uh, usually you can research these sorts of things and... Let's see if the craft website gives me better information. Not just 15 milliliters. Oh man, so we should know the weight of 15 milliliters. We need to make a um, density adjustment. For now, for the all intents and purposes, you know very well, I'm going to go and measure out 15 mils. I'm going to know what the weight is. And I know I'm going to enter this correctly, but... For now, because I want to go to bed. I love you guys. I'm making you a video, but I want to go to bed. Um, I'm going to say it's 15 grams. So 15 grams. I'm not going to worry about those boxes, but those boxes often are used by teams. Let's say I'm at Summer Fresh Salads and I'm making this coleslaw over and over and over again, and I am using Renee's Mighty Caesar, I might give it a code. And oftentimes, if you're working in the same ESHA database over and over again, you'll get code numbers that are internal user codes to make life easier as you're entering this. So I'm going to, over here, it says ingredient, and I've got uh, some top-level information. I'm going to click on nutrients. And in here, this is where it gets fun. I just, nope, that's not going to make it any bigger for me. I'm just wondering if I can. Is that full screen? If I can zoom in here at all. No, I don't think so. So first off, it's 15 grams. I need to jump back and forth. I shouldn't go to full screen. I need to jump back and forth between my screen and the splash top. So let's see, uh, let's see if I can actually make the two windows in the same. Aha, I can. The font gets pretty small though. I'm going to see if I can blow this out and slide this over. So first one is uh, calories. So calories is 80. Calories from fat. That box is blocked out. I want to make this bigger so that you can see it from the back of the room. There we go. Oh, no, come on. See, the fun of making these videos is that I have so many videos to make in any given day. You can see it's 11.30 at night and I want to go to bed. Um, and I do not script these videos. I try and keep them lively and real for you to show you that even though I've been around the block a long, uh, long, long time, there's still things that I am learning how to do, and in this case, it's resizing these forms so that you can see them while we're working on them together. So calories from fat, that's grayed out. There's nothing we can put in there. Calories from saturated fat, nothing we can put in there. Protein, where is that? 0 0.3 grams, 0 0.3. Enter. Carbohydrates, one. 
Total dietary fiber, zero. Total soluble fiber, zero. If it's not there, we're going to assume it's zero. Dietary fiber, zero. Soluble fiber, zero. Now you'll note, this is the 2016 label version. There have been modifications. We mentioned this before. The government is constantly updating how you do nutrition labeling. And so for now, ESH is in the sort of limbo between the 2016 and the 2021 version of the labels. There was a five-year grace period, and as you can guess, that is hitting us right, 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 right now. So total sugars is zero. Now, we talked about the rounding errors. I'm already worried that there may be a little bit of rounding error, but at the same time, remember, you have a plus or minus 20% uh, variance that's allowed within the error on those labels. And so I am not worried, based off of the quantity that we're adding, that it's going to add up to a huge amount. Added sugar is, guess what? It is zero. Monosaccharides, zero. Disaccharides, zero. Other carbs. Carbohydrates on here? It must be a modified starch, so it's got to be the one gram that's there. Fat is nine grams total fat. Saturated fat is 0 0.5. Monounsaturated, we are going to actually leave that blank. Polyunsaturated trans fat is zero. We do know that for sure. Cholesterol is 10. It would be contributed from egg yolk in the product. I do not know what the water is, and I am going to have to do a back adjustment at a later point. Vitamins, zero. Let me just jump out to the web page here and make sure I'm not missing anything. There's no vitamins of note in there. Zero, 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 and I'm just going down the line zero. Minerals of note, zero. Now, inevi inevitably, so I'm a... Different ingredients are going to have different amounts of these columns. If you are getting it from the supplier, let's say, for example, I was summer fresh salads and I was using Renee's salad dressing in one of my salads. Because I built up a supplier relationship with them, I could likely call them and ask for the unrounded values on this so that when I put it into my formulation, I'm not compounding rounding rules upon rounding rules. It, it starts to get dangerous when you start to make things like, think about making a pizza. You've got a pizza crust, you've got a pizza sauce, you've got pepperoni, you've got cheese, you've got uh, maybe sausage nuggets on there. You can start to compound rounding rules on top of rounding rules and it can get really, really, um, it can add to the vagueness of that label. So I think I've entered it all. I'm going to jump out here and increase the screen size for a moment so that we can see it a little bit better. That's as big as it's going to get, I guess. Now I'm going to click on this button here and see check data. Check data, and it says, this is where it's, it's interesting. As we mentioned before, the database is taking advantage of the fact that when I enter one gram of fat, it says, well, it's going to contribute nine calories. If I enter one gram of carbohydrates, it says it's going to contribute four calories. One gram of protein, it's going to contribute four calories. This is where that rounding rule can start to compound as well. But what I'm noting here, I've only entered 0.5 grams of fat, but meanwhile there should be nine. I did need to enter something into the mono and poly. So I need to put in 8.5 somewhere in there. Let's jump back here. If I were to call the supplier, let's say I called up Kraft Heinz and asked, hey, can I get a better breakdown? I'm an industrial product developer and I need a better breakdown on the salad dressing as I'm using it within my product. They would likely oblige me on that. So I do need to double check. So I, when I ch clicked on the check data, that is the, that's the compliance that they're using. So. Let's go to fat here, and I'm going to enter into mono. I'm going to put in four, and just 
4.5 to make up the difference and see now, see, wait a sec, now it adds up to nine and suddenly my check components is aligning. The weight estimated versus weight entered. This is where, as I mentioned before, that water component is missing. And so what are we missing? We are missing 4.7 grams. And now suddenly it makes sense. My carbohydrate available isn't quite making sense either. There are some of these, uh, I want to say, fudge factors that are used frequently by the industry. We should be going back and checking the actual composition of fatty acids, how much of it's monounsaturated, how much of it's polyunsaturated. The irony of ironies is it's not going to show up on the final label. We have to be aware of some of these anomalies when doing these sorts of these sorts of labels. So carbohydrate was showing up here as well as something that's not quite in compliance. So total carbohydrate was one. Total dietary fiber, zero, 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 zero. Total sugars was zero. Added sugar was zero. Monosaccharides, disaccharides, other carbs has to equal one. So that one is not going to want to resolve on us. I am going to leave it. I'm going to click on X, check data. It's gone from being red to being yellow. Is it common to see these sorts of weird anomalies? Yes, it's not, un it's not uncommon at all. I'm going to leave some of these boxes empty and that's not uncommon. I'm not going to worry about yields or measures. Many times within different product development groups, they'll start to do using ESHA for costing. And I personally don't like using ESHA for costing, but there are lots of groups that do like to use it for costing. So at this point, I have got my ingredient and I'm going to make sure that I have, I want to make sure that I'm going to save the ingredient as an EXL file, because as soon as I shut down Splashtop, let's say I want to come back and modify my, my salad and change the amount of salad dressing or whatever, I need to be able to reload that into, I need to be able to reload it. And so I'm going to be able to find it in my OneDrive. And I believe I have a curriculum. Wait a second, where's my new curriculum? I'm going to save it just for now in my fall 2020, just for fun. So Renee's Mighty Caesar dressing is gonna get saved there and it's now exported. Cancel. Now, if I go back to my carrot coleslaw, let's see, did I save the ingredient? Well, save. Save Renee's Mighty Caesar dressing, save, and that should now be in my database. So if I go back to my recipe, carrot coleslaw, we saw it before. When I typed in Renee's, it did not show up. Renee, let's check now. There we go. Renee's Mighty Caesar dressing, select. And now I can add, let's say, I don't know, how many grams did I have in there? 30 grams? Sure, let's say I had 30 grams. Click OK, and there we go. Now it's in my recipe. I can click on view label and there it is. Carrots, salad dressing, kale, pumpkin seeds, hemp seeds. Now remind myself, allergen statement. Oh, you know what? I don't want to jump to my allergen statement yet. I need to modify my ingredient statement because I've got that salad dressing. However, we know that in that salad dressing there are components. And if you've ever uh, read a uh, label on a food product, think of that frozen pizza. Some of those components that are in there have, a, uh, the ingredients have ingredients. Those are what we call components. So if I go into edit, I can go in and unclick program generated statement. And where it says Renee's Mighty Caesar dressing, I will put a bracket. And if I go to that post-it note, 
copy and go back to here now I've got my ingredients from the salad dressing and then I've got curly kale, pumpkin seeds, hemp seeds and that looks good click OK and click OK and now it reflects the salad dressing components within there so I've got Renee's Mighty Caesar dressing and in this case, I am going to leave that branding on there. Maybe I want to have that as part of my marketing to say it's a Renee's Caesar, uh, garlic Caesar carrot coleslaw. I will want to go in and modify my allergen statement at this point. And if I slide this over, I can see that, do I have crustaceans in here? I do have fish. I have mustard. I have milk ingredients. I have egg ingredients. That in its own right is interesting, and this might be something that I want to modify in the future. Maybe I like this as a baseline recipe, but maybe I need to move it towards a vegetarian version or a vegan virgin version because this is not vegetarian. So there's no crustacean, but there is egg, there's fish, there's, I don't believe there's gluten in there. Click don't show this again. I don't believe there's any gluten ingredients, so we're looking for wheat. There is milk ingredients because there is uh, Parmesan cheese. Mollusks, no. Mustard, yes. Peanut, no. Sesame, no. But if, let's say my pumpkin seeds or my hemp seeds had a may contains sesame seeds, but maybe it's packaged on the same line, then I would have to carry that forward. Shellfish, no. Soy, did it have soy in it? No, it was made with canola oil and it did not have any other soy ingredients. Tree nuts, again, if my pumpkin seed said um, may contain tree nuts, then that would have to carry forward into my declaration. And no wheat. I believe that's it. I click on OK. And now that's cleaned up. And we've got a uh, better ingredient declaration. I see my uh, nutrients here. It's quite a nutrient dense um, salad, but it's 200 grams. Is 200 grams too big a serving? Let's just do a quick reference. Reference serving size CFIA. Serving sizes and reference amounts. What is a proper serving size of this product. So I'm going to serving size and reference amounts. Let's click on the reference amounts. Once upon a time, this was part of the Food and Drugs Regulation. Now with the Safe Food for Canadians Act and Regulation, they're changing how it's being used. But if who is this for? It, it, a reference amount is a typical amount of, of products served in one sitting. And it's either used to be uh, help define what a single serving container should be, or it helps define within a multi-serving package what that single serving should look like. And it helps define an appropriate framework for making a nutrient content claim or a nutrition facts panel. So let's find, you'll see it, the food products are grouped together into uh, sort of friendly different headings and it should be down here in vegetables vegetables without sauce vegetables with sauce vegetables for garnish chili peppers seaweed vegetable juice olives sun-dried tomatoes relish vegetable sauces purees this is the whole web page and sometimes Rather than going into those headings, I want to just type control F and find salad. So I shouldn't look in vegetables, I should look in salads. What is it? Salads such as egg fish, shellfish, bean, vegetable, meat, ham, or poultry salad, except those listed as a separate item in, in column one. And our reference amount for that salad is 100 grams. So let's go back to splash top here. What was my serving size? 200 grams. Whoa, wait a second. I actually have two servings in there. Let's jump back to my recipe 
and I should be able to go in and set my serving size here on this one here, set serving size. Recipe makes one serving. No, I want my serving to weigh. I can modify this to be 100 grams and click OK. And now I check my label again and it's been adjusted to have 100 grams. Last but not least, if I wanted to, I could go into editing some of these uh, minor things on the top, like edit, uh, what is it? Ah, uh, see, I'm going to muck this up. When I click on view label, edit label, that's what I should be clicking on. I can go in there and I can say servings per container. And I click on here. And I should be able to edit this servings per container as. I can go in there and edit that. Ah, I'm not I'm not doing it right. It's almost midnight. I'm going to do another video for you at a later point in time, but you have learned how to enter your own ingredient from, um, from a different source. You have also seen how you can enter in the component ingredient, so the ingredients of your ingredient, if you need to, and we added some complexity. So now we can change the serving size, and we did a quick reference check into the reference serving sizes for different food products, a table of reference amounts of food. So we've added more complexity to our Esha this time around. I hope you're having fun playing around with Esha. Don't have any worries about breaking the software. Just go in and muck around with it. And at most, just click on the disconnect button because the virtual machine will reset the whole thing. You can't break, you can't break the Esha. You can just have fun, and if you think you've got yourself into a mess, just shut it down and start again, because you saw it doesn't take a lot of time to start a new recipe. Save your files as you go along so that you can always reopen something that you've been working on that has been successful, and so you don't have to necessarily start from scratch. But if you do have to start from scratch, the more you practice, the easier it becomes. All right, so if you have questions about doing more Esha, feel free to reach out and... Have fun, and we'll talk to you soon. And disconnect from the splash top by pressing the disconnect button. All right, I'm going to disconnect now. Cheers.